Hey guys, how's it going? I'm back here with another video and today I decided to bring this video where I'm going to be going over three advanced React.js interview questions. I've made a video in the past where I went over six interview questions in React. However, most of them were very beginner questions and I found that there is a lack of videos on this specific topic on YouTube. So for that reason, I wanted to bring this video. To make this video, I'm basing it off my own experience and also experience that I found from other people while doing my research. But it's important to know that uh, it doesn't mean that you will necessarily be asked these questions. However, I hope that the level of difficulty will remain the same within all the interviews you guys have to go through. So with that in mind, let's get into the video. Before we get into the video, I want to talk a little bit about today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant is an amazing platform where students are able to learn from a variety of carefully made courses. They have thousands of lessons and topics related to STEM, and the best part is that new lessons are added every single month. If you are a person who's looking to improve your skills in math, science, and computer science, this is literally the perfect place for you. In my videos, usually I explain a lot of higher level concepts. However, none of this knowledge would be possible without an understanding of how computer Computer science works on its lower levels. So learning from Brilliant's Computer Science Fundamentals course could really help out some of you guys who still lacks the knowledge of how computer science works in its core. Also, for anyone who is currently studying to pass their coding intervals, which I know for a fact is a lot of you guys, you should check out their Algorithms Fundamentals course because it has everything necessary for you guys to get started learning how to interpret and solve algorithm questions and programming. The whole platform is full of valuable information, which I think any of you guys would benefit from it. So if you're interested in checking them out, just visit brilliant.org slash pagerotech or click the link that will be in the description. The first 200 of you who click the link in the description or just visit the website will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Okay, everyone. So let's get into the interview questions. And the first question that I think is really nice to be asked in an interview is how exactly does the React reconciliation algorithm work and how it's beneficial for the creation of a React application. So the reason why I think this question is good is because it, it kind of points out the fact that if you're able to answer this question, you kind of understand why you're using React instead of just building a project using, I don't know, vanilla JavaScript or um, some other framework where the UI is rendered in some different way. So for those who don't know, React's reconciliation algorithm is the process by which React updates its components based on its props and states. And here we're talking specifically about how React handles its UI. We all know that there is uh, the normal uh, DOM tree, right? There's the, the all the DOM elements. But with React, there's another concept which um, you might already be familiar with and you should be familiar with if you're interviewing for a React position, which is the virtual DOM. So technically, React keeps track of two different versions of the DOM, meaning that there are two different versions of the DOM tree. So whenever there's a change in the component, what React does is it kind of compares the virtual DOM tree of the updated component with the virtual DOM tree of the previous render. So if there is any difference between both virtual DOM trees, uh, React will trigger an update and actually change the actual DOM. And obviously to optimize this, React will also calculate uh, the minimum required amount of changes in, or in the actual DOM in order to make the DOM sync with the virtual DOM. This is crucial to understanding how React actually works because this algorithm technically reduces the amount of DOM manipulations, which further improves performance in the app. This answer wouldn't be that long, I think, uh, just giving up the basics, explaining that you guys actually know uh, what are the benefits and actually explaining the difference between the virtual DOM and the actual DOM would be a good way to start this answer as well. Um, just explaining the general idea behind uh, the reconciliation algorithm in, in React would be good enough. Uh, again, I'm not an interviewer, but I do think that that should demonstrate that you have the knowledge necessary to answer such question. It would be also good if you could point out situations where uh, the reconciliation algorithm can become inefficient. But to be honest, I think the best way to approach interview questions like this is being straightforward forward with your answer, because then it will not look like you're dancing around the question and you actually know what you're talking about. So the second interview question that I'm going to be talking about in this video is how does react handle asynchronous updates and how this could resolve potential race conditions. So again, this is more of like some of how react works internally, uh, which again, these are advanced react interview questions. So obviously, I don't think you would be asked like very simple, straightforward syntax based questions. It's more about if you understand react and 
it's th and the theory behind it, right? So to answer this question, I think it would be good to talk a little bit about how React uses batching to resolve its problems. So React's batching mechanism is basically a way that React groups a bunch of updates that occur within the same render cycle into just a single update. So if a lot of things changes, right, a lot of states changes, uh, a lot of, I don't know, maybe some props changes as well, um, and they all happen in the same render cycle, it is important that you handle those changes as a single update, right? Because then it improves performance, it prevents you from updating your components a lot of times when it all happened in the same render cycle, so you don't have to re-render your component uh, unnecessarily. The coolest part of this is that not only it prevents unnecessary renders, but it also maintains the idea that your UI will be uh, responsive even when there are a lot of updates happening at the same time. I've talked about this in the past, but in React 18, the, uh, the React team even made some changes such that automatic batching will happen everywhere before it actually only happened in certain parts of your React application. But now with, with a new update of React and probably with future versions as well, um, it will basically happen automatically everywhere in your app. So that's really nice. And it is an important aspect of React to understand in its higher levels. But also I mentioned how this can potentially resolve what is known as race conditions in React. And you have to explain what race conditions are. Maybe I think it's okay to not know the terminology and you can just ask them to specify a little bit um, on what it means. But basically what race conditions are is, is a situation where two or more components try to update the same state simultaneously, which obviously if you're trying to do that, it can potentially lead to unwanted behavior, if you know what I mean? Like if a state depends on the previous value of, of itself, right? But the order of updating the state uh, is not in the correct order, um, you just get unpredictable results. So there are actually multiple different techniques that you can use to prevent this from happening. A great way to solve this is obviously using uh, the use state and the use register hooks because they allow you to manage state updates in an asynchronous and safe manner. Also with the use effect hook, you can perform side effects and kind of coordinate your asynchronous updates, which is um, useful for preventing this kind of situations. Now the last interview question that I think it's important for you guys to know is how do you solve optimization problems in React and is it good to always optimize? So I'm gonna actually start by talking, giving you guys the answer to the second part of the question, which is, is it good to always optimize? Cause it's kind of straightforward. Uh, not technically, uh, it is not always good to optimize. Sometimes overly optimizing a React application can lead to actual diminished performance. So it is important to note that, and I've made a video on optimization in the past, which I mentioned a little bit about this, but uh, I think it's important to make that clear when the interviewer asks you something like this. But the reason why I love this question is because when you're in your job, you will need to optimize uh, your code so that you're working with like a large scale application usually, right? So you will need to optimize to some extent and um, being able to prove that you're able to do this is essential because in my opinion, that's actually one of the most important questions you can ask a React developer. It shows that not only you understand how React works uh, like syntax wise, but also how it works in a more advanced context where you need to take into account uh, stuff like user experience. Uh, that's why you're increasing performance, right? So that's why I love this question. So the way I personally optimize my projects, and I've talked about this in the past, and I think it's it's basically how everyone optimizes their projects um, is by utilizing the React developer tools. Uh, as you can see on my screen, this is an extension. Uh, you can download it, I believe, in most browsers. Uh, I, I use Google Chrome, but um, you can see this is the extension. It's used by a lot of users, uh, and I already, already have it in my Chrome. But what it allows you to do is when you come over here to your application, right, and you click on inspect element, you should see that there are obviously all of the normal uh, tabs that you can play around with if you are just inspecting element, right? However, with this uh, Chrome extension, now you can see that there are two options down here at the bottom. So I'll go over each of them. So if I click on components, you'll see that you can actually see all of your components laid out perfectly, uh, just like this inside of your application, which is really cool. Not only that, but it also allows you to see a lot of stuff like states that you have inside of your app. As you can see, you can see props, uh, I don't know, like URL links, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of information where you can play around with, but to be honest, this isn't even the part which is important for optimization. The part that is important for optimization is the profiler uh, tab over here. 
you can click on it and you can see you're able to record certain actions inside of your app and see how your components react to those actions. For example, if, uh, if I clicked on, I don't know, anything here, I changed tabs or whatever, nothing is appearing over here. But if I click on the record button, it will start profiling and I try to switch tabs, you'll see I'll stop this and now there's a lot of components appearing in our screen. What are these components that appear here? Or what are these things that appear here? Well, they are the, the time it took, they tell the time it took for each of those components to render. I switched tabs a, a couple of times, right? So some of the components re-rendered a couple of times. You can see uh, it tells us the amount of time it took to render. So now let's test something. If I click on this over here and I click on log out and then click again, you'll see some stuff definitely happened. There were a lot of requests as well. Uh, a lot of components changed, some did not render at all. So because like, for example, the, the browser router and the router and the location, they didn't change because I didn't change the location in my app. However, there were a couple changes, like the navboard did change and it tells you exactly how it, how long it took to change. Not only that, but see how many information you can get from this. So now you might be asking, why exactly is this useful? Well. The clear, the clear answer to this is just that since you know now how long each components take to render, you can have actual good insight onto uh, which components should be taking a little bit more and which shouldn't. So if you have any issues in your code that are making components take too long to render or are re-rendering many times, you can actually take a look and see um, pretty easily. Uh, this is how I believe most React developers optimize their code. They don't actually start out optimizing before a problem occurs. They just um, write their code and whenever something seems to not be working correctly, they check out, analyze, and then try to find the piece of code that is causing that issue. So this is what I would say. I would definitely mention the React Profiler because me personally working at a, at a big tech company, I've seen everyone using this uh, because it is one of the biggest methods to um, optimize your projects. This is basically it for the video. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like down below and comment what you want to see next. Subscribe because I'm posting twice a week and I would massively appreciate it. Again, thank you Brilliant for sponsoring the video. If you guys could check them out, that would be massively important to me because it's what helps me continue posting. It supports the channel in a massive way and it's also a really good platform. So uh, that's basically it. Really hope you guys enjoyed it and I see you guys next time.